Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash audiodrama reviews. Keep listening to see what we recommend. Tell us about yourself, your background, and how it helped your fiction writing. Well, I am, as people know, a rare book viewer. I specialize in the sale of writers and uh, musicians and scientists' archives. Now, as a writer, to see how other writers work, how they think, how they handle manuscripts, how they handle language, is really very, very informative about, you know, it, it gives you a broad sense of the different ways people handle the process of writing. I'll give you an example. I was working with Stephen Sondheim, and in his study, he has a wall just of dictionaries, all kinds of dictionaries. And if you look at his manuscripts, when he's writing lyrics for a song, he may have you know, four or five different possibilities for a word and a lyric. So it, it, it's very similar, by the way the manuscripts of Dylan Thomas. You know, Sondheim, like Dylan Thomas, are very, very conscious of each word. I had somebody once said to me, some writers write page by page, some writers write paragraph by paragraph, some writers, you know, sentence by sentence, and some rare writers write word by word. And it's just the way you approach the intensity of any uh, of any phrase, any line, or any idea. So that's what you know, my, uh, my occupation taught me. Okay. Describe your writing process. Well, my writing process, basically I write in bed. I have to be completely relaxed. I write with a pen and on paper. I like the visceral sense of writing and the formation of words because I'm one of those writers that writes word by word. So I'm very, very conscious of what I'm doing and what I'm saying and the words I'm using. Other than that, I think most writers who are practiced um, will say this. They don't really write. They take dictation. And that's really what I do. I have a character. Um, You know, I develop this character. He's there. And or the moment, I let the moment speak to me, and I write it down. I'm a great believer in the subconscious, in the sense that the subconscious really does most of the thinking and most of the informing as a writer. Jack Harrowack talked about automatic writing. I don't quite believe in automatic writing. But I believe in the process of allowing the story to tell itself and following it, not trying to impose your will on what's going on. You may have a broad outline in your mind of where it's going, but you don't want to micromanage something that really should be uh, much more free to express itself. Okay. How often does the writing process you do get in the way or it hinder your, the genre you're working in, like historical fiction, I guess? That's a good question. The answer is, strangely enough, I don't believe in, uh, I don't believe in what writer's block. I believe in not knowing what you're talking about. Uh, I think in the years, all the decades I've been writing, I can think of twice when I literally looked at a page and the page looked back at me and said, not today, kid. Most of the time it's because I didn't quite know what I was talking about or I was missing a key. Now, many times I talked to my secretary or I would talk to my wife, who's a psychiatric social worker, and I'd say, this is my problem. I need motivation here. The character is this, that, and the other thing. What do you think? And you know, it's amazing how 
So my wife, who's brilliant at this, would say, well, I see this. And I'd say, oh. And all of a sudden, a little light would go on in my subconscious, and I could write. So that's, that's basically my process. So what have you been working on these past few months or so? Oh, I'm working on Shakespeare. Okay. I'm writing a book about Shakespeare, about his lost years. There's a period in his life from roughly 15, uh, 1583 to 1590, where nobody knows what he did. And I decided to write about that. Now, because I have a masochist, an egomaniac, I wrote it as a mock autobiography, and I wrote it in the language of Shakespeare. My particular version of it, because Elizabethan prose, I think to the modern ear, would be a little much. But anyway, I, I, that's what I did, because I thought it would be an interesting way of doing it. So what's the status and publication of that book? Well, I'm working on it now. I'm just I'm working on editing it. At the moment, I'm very pleased, but I've learned something about writing, and that is when I get too pleased about something, I better look at it again. I'm quite aware of a writer's inability to understand what he's doing. At the moment he's doing it, you're just too close to it. And you have to pull back. And, you know, you need people who can read it and tell you. You know, the rarest thing on, on earth is to have a very good reader. Someone who's objective. Somebody who knows what they're reading. I had a letter many years ago from Kathleen Ann Porter. And she said, I no longer teach people how to write. I teach people how to read. And I think that's much more important. I mean, if you don't have people who can read, you're not going to have an audience. So I thought Catherine Ann had a very, was very insightful. Very nice, very nice. This episode, we're recommending George Robert Minkoff's historical fiction trilogy, In the Land of Whispers. As a writer of historical fantasy, it was interesting to hear about George's process of writing and researching. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash audiodrama reviews. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash audiodrama reviews for your free audiobook. What made you want to tell a historical fiction story from the perspective of Europe and America during the Elizabethan era? Because the two stories are interrelated. And as I said, when I started this book, I had no idea where it was going. I had a vague idea, but I just let the story tell itself. And if I needed to go to South America, I would. If I needed to go around, you know, you know to circumnavigate the world, I would do that. I mean, so I ended up being in, you know, Arthur and Antarctica, and the story just let itself be told. I think that's I think that's a very good way to look at it. You let the story let itself be told, and that's what I did. Going off that, do you outline your books, or how does your research process differ from your writing process? I don't outline anything. I think it, it destroys the spontaneity of the book. I have a very strong, uh, vague uh, idea where the story is going. In historical fiction, that's easier because you know the history. But mm -hmm. I would never outline. I never did. And especially in the trilogy, when the plot moves back and forth, I just wrote. I said, okay, this feels like a good place for a break. And I would break the story and we would go on to another story. It was strictly a process of by the seat of my pants. That's the way I did it. I just didn't, I think I was just naive. And I figured, oh, I'll do it this way and see what happens. And is that the same for your research process? That's a very good story and a very good point. My attitude is that I'm writing about uh, whatever I'm writing about. Let's just say Panama, the gold shipment in Panama. I would find everything I know about the gold ship, how they were done, 
who did them, where they went, uh, what they look like. I'm a great believer in detail. See, I believe that literature is a visual art, and the more visual images I can give, I want people to read my books as if they're watching a movie. And that's why I love detail. I know a lot of people, you know, a lot of other writers I've spoken to say, oh, I don't like detail. It interferes with my creativity. By the way, creativity is a word I do not like. What they're really saying is, I don't have the vision to take all this information and create a whole, an entirety of a book. And that's the word I love. I love the epic quality of the world. And that's why my books, you know, these my historical novels tend to be kind of epics. Even if they're not very long, they tend to be very complex. To say this, and this I think is very important for everyone who wants to write it, and that is with Captain Smith and with Drake and with Shakespeare. Most historians, scholars, etc., stick to their discipline, and they don't look at the deeper social ramifications of what was going on, whether it's Stratford or Elizabeth Court. I don't believe that. I believe you want to know everything. And you want to read, especially, you want to read the books that most scholars wouldn't think about. It gives you information, gives you ideas, and gives you a perspective that most dry, you know, literary criticism or historical criticism doesn't give. Anything you want to tell the audience before we sign off, I guess, like your Facebook, Twitter, that kind of stuff? Oh, yeah. Well, if you want, I have a Facebook page. I also write children's books. I wrote children's books for my granddaughter because I didn't like what I was seeing in, in children's literature. I think most of it tends to be social engineering. And the one thing that is always missing is imagination. And I think this is a detriment to children. Children need imagination. Basically, their, their inner life is being stifled by the media, by, by other, uh, you know, children's, what's supposed to be written for children, which I think is written for adults, but that's another point. But that's what I do. I like imagination. I like imagination it's for my granddaughter. I like it for language. One of the things I find so depressing is that all right? well, not all, but many writers all sound exactly the same. It's sort of the creative writing school's curse upon us. As I've always said, for 4,000 years, Western civilization has produced a fair number of rather interesting minds, give or take a dark age or two. But basically, that was happened. And none of them went to a creative writing class. You want to be a creative writer? You sit down and you write. And I don't like the word creative. That's what you do. That's what every writer is always done. They sit down and see what happens. And that's something else that uh, that letter of Catherine Ann Porter said. He said the easiest thing for a writer is to find his own voice. All you have to do is be yourself. And going to this academic process of creative writing is not helpful for that. Or as I said, the one time I ever gave a lecture on writing is, and I said, why do you want to go to a creative writing school? The only thing they're going to teach you is their mistakes. And obviously I was never invited back. But anyway... <laughs> Mm -hmm. I have a good time. Thank you for the conversation, and I will see you all next time on Audio Drama Reviews.